<clears throat> Hello, um, uh, today is uh, July 17th, uh, 2023, and we'll talk about um, uh, Bertrand uh, Goldberg, a uh, very important uh, modern architect from, uh, from the United States. And after that, we'll talk about a very, very important Ottoman architect, Mimar Sinan, himself associated with the date of um, the day of the 17th of July. He died on the 17th of July. Uh, Mimar Sinan, <clears throat> while Bertrand Goldberg, as you can see, he was born on July 17th, 1913, so 110 years ago. He was an American architect and industrial designer, best known for the Marina City Complex in Chicago, Illinois, the tallest reinforced concrete building in the world at the time of completion. Uh, this was the man, Bertrand Goldberg, uh, some important architects love, love uh, bow ties, and he, he was no exception. Uh, now, the Dr. Aaron Heimbach House, the Blue Island, Illinois, 1939. Um, so before the Second World War, uh, you know, an early architectural work. But you can see already, you know, qualities although he was not too adventurous here, and later he wouldn't work so often with the rectangularity, but at that time he did. <clears throat> but still, this is architecture, and uh, you know, Bertrand Goldberg announced himself as a, as a serious architect with this early, early house. <clears throat> yes, a modernistic house. 1939, a little bit early, I would say. I, mean, I would have expected this kind of architecture mid-century, not 1939. Anyway, um, I like the, the, the stair here and, and its shadows on that, uh, uh, on that uh, adjacent uh, wall. The furniture was probably not designed by him, although he was also a designer later on. So with simple means, he created uh, a building which is, uh, it has even uh, some kind of a monumentality, if monumentality is needed in the case of a house. Now the, the chairs tell a different story. If you look at the, at the stair, uh, that's, you know, in a different spirit from uh, the furniture, but maybe the furniture belonged to the client and not to the architect, thus representing the taste of the client and not the architect. Plants are always beautiful, <clears throat> even if uh, wild plants, or maybe particularly if wild plants, I think we shouldn't cut down any plant, any, any, any grass, any bushes, any trees. We need them badly. As we need badly, probably the, and without probably, the bricks, the brick wall, which doesn't pollute. As we probably also need pianos to play music. Um, Okay, another, uh, another house from 1955. So we jumped over the Second World War uh, with mural by uh, T. Lux Feininger. I don't know if he was a um, member of the Feininger family. Um, Lionel Feininger, as you know, he was the, one of the instructors at the Bauhaus. In fact, the only uh, American uh, present in the Bauhaus as an instructor, not to say professor or master, invited by Walter Gropius, but I don't know if T. Lux Feininger uh, belonged to, to that family. Uh, now pictures here, Levin House, 1956. This one uh, makes me think a little bit of a house that um, uh, Louis Kahn uh, built and was uh, almost um, left to, um, you know, uh, falling apart. I like very much the, the, the woodwork of the, the structure of the, of the roof. 
both in the case of that uh, house by Louis Kahn and this house by um, uh, Bertrand Goldberg. Now, of course, Kahn also used um, a similar uh, uh, exposed uh, wood, woodwork for the Trenton um, bus, public bus that he designed and built together with Anne King. Bertrand Goldberg. But you will see later on he, he built uh, differently and uh, using a lot of concrete. At this time, he was still uh, perhaps um, you know, uh, testing his uh, abilities <clears throat> without um, yet arriving at his signature works. But they're still good, they are still good buildings. And the pianos, you can see, still present. And so is the chimney or the fireplace. Now, a hotel from 1963, Astor Tower Hotel in Chicago, 1963, not bad. Uh, rectangularity is not a scene, and you can do great things using the right angle. And here is another example, uh, an impressive tower. A hotel. A hotel, but I see here, you know, rather apartments, not uh, typical hotel rooms. <clears throat> Bertrand Goldberg. Maybe if you would have, if I'm allowed to express a subjective view, maybe if you would have treated these um, round columns a little bit uh, differently, you know, on the on the base, the bottom part of the building would have been better. But even so, I think it's an interesting building without, again, yet arriving at his signature architecture work, which you'll see involves... Uh, uh, you know, different uh, geometries working with, uh, with roundness, with a circle or segments of the circle. Maybe there are some influences coming from, um, you know, the European aesthetics that Miss van der Rohe brought to Chicago. Uh, Miss arrived at be, being dominant, the dominant force in, um, in architecture in Chicago. And uh, I'm not sure how to evaluate this. You know, somehow the, the great masters of the past in Chicago were a little bit forgotten, like Frank Lloyd Wright or Louis Sullivan. Thanks to the, you know, towering uh, effect or effects of uh, Miss Van der Rohe. A convention center in Florida, 1965, uh, rather, you know, imposing during construction and, uh, you know, uh, coming closer to finalizing the work. And here it is. A vast arena of pharaonic proportions, Florida, Bertrand Goldberg. The giant hut. <clears throat> if I am to express myself oxymoronically. <clears throat> Here are the Towers Apartments, Chicago, 1996, 19, um, yeah, 1966. And here we begin to see the so-called real Bertrand Goldberg or, or the, the recognizable Bertrand Goldberg, the one who laughed uh, 
uh, you know, um, roundness, and uh, you can see this here on the left, but also a little bit on the right. He was an architect because he didn't neglect form. Uh, and uh, they do have character. I mean, you know, the buildings are not any buildings. You might not agree with this, um, you know, aesthetical statement, but uh, it's still it's still architecture. And uh, beyond the subjectivity of choice, uh, they stand as an example uh, of what an architect with a certain personality can do. <clears throat> Bertrand Goldberg, <clears throat> still, you know, earlier works, but we are we are we are getting closer to the so-called classic Bertrand Goldberg. Family housing. These are not, uh, you know, opulent apartments. As you can see, they 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 use the space uh, very well. So if Philip Johnson was right that architecture is the art of losing space or wasting space, maybe in this particular work, uh, Bertrand Goldberg uh, didn't serve that art very well because he didn't waste too much space. And, and uh, one of the inhabitants, not, a, not the son of a millionaire probably, but the, this, these buildings again, I think they were very close to being what we call social housing. So it is possible to do good architecture, even with a rather modest uh, uh, budgets, but I don't know you know, if they would qualify indeed for um, uh, social housing. Now, the a mental health center here, we are in the, in the, in the territory of, uh, I mean, the specific territory of uh, Bertrand Goldberg. 1967, Elgin, Illinois, a beautiful tree. And, uh, you know, the, the health, uh, health facility uh, mental health center in Elgin, Illinois, 1967. As I already said, uh, Bertrand Goldberg, um, his signature work is, um, you know, affectionate towards um, the circle. Uh, SOM proposes new use for SOM being Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill proposes, now you are going to see a, a project um, done by, proposed by SOM uh, to create a new use for Bertrand Goldberg's Elgin, Elgin Laundry Building, which is a very interesting building. And I regret um, it was, uh, you know, it, it, it was left in this state, <clears throat> but <clears throat> it, it has force even uh, as, um, as an abandoned building, I would say. Bertrand Goldberg, let's hope they kept it alive. Uh, back to the, the health, uh, mental health um, uh, center uh, that he built. I like, uh, <clears throat> you know, the, the drama of these arches in, in, uh, in concrete, making one think a little bit of Louis Kahn. St. Joseph Medical Center in Tacoma, Washington, 1969. Uh, look at the plan, you know, it's uh, flower-like. And uh, surprisingly, uh, if uh, Zaha Hadid lived longer, 
it's very possible that uh, some of, of her buildings or some of the buildings um, produced, uh, designed in her office would have moved um, towards, you know, at least in plan towards this kind of architecture. And some gestures in that sense were already made by Zaha Hadid. Architects. The exterior is is very different from uh, from what Zaha did and does, and will do. But uh, I said will do, although Zaha is not with us any longer. But uh, through her spirit and her office, architecture will continue to receive from them um, probably provocative uh, uh, buildings. But this one by Bertrand Goldberg also is, um, I would say, remarkable. And um, it's a medical center. So why should why should medical centers or hospitals look like hospitals, meaning devoid of um, aesthetical virtues? Maybe you know an interesting building would uh, would uh, cure a little bit some patients, you know, through the. Uh, you know, through, through the Elan Vital uh, of an architecture that is architecture. So I, I, I salute uh, Bertrand Goldberg for, um, you know, uh, escaping uh, the monotony and the predictability of the so-called, um, you know, hospital architecture. He was an interesting architect, and uh, now I regret I didn't uh, talk with our friend uh, Bruce Danzinger, who knows his son. Maybe we could have invited him to pay homage um, to his father uh, with him, part of, uh, you know, being a participant. He probably would have said some interesting things about his father. Anyway, but beyond uh, these things, stand his buildings and his buildings are uh, his buildings not somebody else's buildings bertrand goldberg yes a hospital why not some kind of an architectural flowering towards good health. But he designed uh, some other building here in this campus, the St. Joseph Healthcare Center. Uh, another hospital in Chicago, 1975, and it was demolished in 2013 another irrational action of the so-called generously called homo sapiens is this building here there was a proposal by studio gang Ginny gang to amplify the the building based on on the needs of the hospital but they opted in the end for uh, demolishing it and it's very sad it could have been used, no? Even if it was insufficient in terms of space, it could have been used. But Homo sapiens uh, thinks, um, you know, uh, it's less productive to keep something than to demolish something. As uh, in the Brave New World, we read, ending is better than mending. Ending is better than mending. Ending is better than mending. Sarcastically, of course, something like this could be, could be said. We don't mend any longer. We just end. No, we demolish. With its majesty, the bulldozer. And this was architecture. This was a good building. Okay, it became maybe insufficient in terms of space. 
but a different function could have been found for this building. Why demolish it? Is it sustainable to demolish? Very sad. So we, we can wonder, uh, does Homo sapiens deserve his name? Bertrand Goldberg, this building does not exist any longer. And here is the, the architect in front of his building. I wonder if he contemplated, uh, you know, such a destiny, such a fate for his building uh, being demolished. One day, Stony Brook University Hospital, another hospital from 1976-1980, Stony Brook, New York. And... Uh, we see again, you know, uh, an attempt to uh, uplift, in a way, the users of the hospitals, unfortunate as they are, and we, we could all be confronted with this lack of fortune to be sick, to be ill. But a good architecture, I think, could have the effect of, of, of at least, you know, diminishing a little bit the fear that is associated with the illness. Through, the, through, a, through a courageous architectural gesture. Maybe it's not the architecture we do today. Maybe some people would have a different taste, but it's still an attempt to escape banality and to escape predictability. Bertrand Goldberg. You could almost say building against illness. Willfully building against illness. Or as Picasso would say, la taxe est une fuite en avant. Meaning to attack what you are afraid of. So if you are afraid of illness, instead of running away from it, you attack it. And you attack it through a good architecture or through an architecture that aspires to be just that architecture. Now, for some, it might not be so good or handsome. For others, it might be. But the attempt is there to, to oppose you know, the, the, the darkness of fear associated with illness, creativity. This is beyond the subjectivity of what I like and someone else doesn't like. No, this is about um, an attempt to, 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 yes, to assert creativity in the face of danger and in the face of illness. Good Samaritan Hospital, another hospital in Phoenix, Arizona, 1982. Yes, maybe his signature architecture is too obviously Bertrand, Bertrand Goldberg's architecture. But it's still architecture. And here are some plans of these hospitals that he uh, created. Here they are. Um, you know, who would have thought to, to, to make such hospitals, you know, in, in plan flower-like? And I, I think it's, 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 it's a courageous attempt and he built some of them. Maybe all of these plans were actually built. But now we arrive at, at his uh, most important work, the Marina City, which still exists. Fortunately, they didn't um, demolish it. And they are remarkable, these towers. Uh, well, it doesn't say here when it was built maybe in the 60s or early 70s, with an ample parking underneath, I mean, you know, the, the, the bottom of the towers and then the, the apartments 
uh, above. But compared to the buildings that we can see in the interstitial space and on the right and on the left, they still stand out because they express the will of the architect. the form-giving architect? Or is it redundant to say form-giving architect? Because I think all architects, all architects who deserve their name as being architects are form-giving. You can't have architecture without some concern for form, without falling into formalism, if possible. or any ism for that matter. Isms become systems and systems almost uh, by definition uh, are not completely pro-creativity, I would say, because they are mechanical, you know, they are systems, they are rigid and they are demanding and they don't offer enough freedom. Although even Andrei Tarkovsky, the great Russian film director uh, in the film um, uh, he created in Sweden, uh, he, uh, The Sacrifice, he uh, does say at one moment through the mouth of a character that um, systems could, could be, could be, um, could be positive. Um, and not just negative. I don't know, it's a long discussion. Maybe we should talk one day about systems. Systems in architecture. Is this a system to an extent it is? You know, all apartments are like this, opening like a fan towards the outside. And uh, But there is also the sensibility of, um, of um, you know, of the, of, of roundness. And, uh, you know, the ingenuity and power of the structural system, you know, and, and even the process of erecting this, you know, willful and assertive towers. The, the process of building them in itself is, is, uh, is architectural or architecture. I keep saying and I keep thinking that a good architecture is good at any stage in its coming into being. Because the spirit of that creation is transparent. Doesn't matter the, the process of building, the building just started or ended or is somewhere in the middle. Bertrand Goldberg. Marina City, Chicago. Now a school, Uptown Buena Park, Brennan, Brennan uh, School, an interesting school. Again, the willful architect who wants to create architecture and uh, it's, it's not any school. It's this school designed by this architect and not somebody else. Reinforced, reinforced concrete. Providence Hospital in Alabama, 1987. So another hospital uh, uh, some years later in Alabama, again, the, the flowering hospital, as we already saw some examples of in his earlier work, Bertrand Goldberg, and now back to the Marina City uh, in Chicago. They are imposing these towers, and uh, we do have to acknowledge that they do have some quality, architecturally speaking. Now, the master plan and buildings for the campus of Wilbur Wright College, Chicago, 1993. 
even here, you know, you, you can tell there was an architect here. And, and, and I say this because it's obviously present a will to form. The diagonals amplify the dynamic qualities of the building. The structure is uh, transparent in the sense that it is um, open to uh, being deciphered by the, by the mind and the eye of the, of the, uh, of the one who is there. Well, in, in essence, what do we see here? We see the work of an architect animated by a certain amount of idealism. Now, if we agree with his idealism or not, this is another question. But there is an attempt to amplify, uh, you know, uh, emotional participation, to amplify, um, you know, desire in a way. And I know in education, uh, some people would say we don't need desire in, uh, in schools or colleges. You know, we need, uh, uh, you know, obedience. But I'm totally against this. I think, I think uh, Albert Einstein was correct when he said students are not recipients <clears throat> or containers <clears throat> to be filled with data or information but torches to be lit up. So for uh, students who are supposed to be, you know, uh, ardent uh, torches, a good building or a building that is um, adventurous, uh, creative, uh, dynamic is, uh, I would say is, uh, is, is welcome. Now, I don't know about this pyramidal uh, structure, which reminds one of, an early work by him, that uh, large uh, building uh, that I, I even employed the word pharaonic. This one too, I guess uh, Bertrand Goldberg had some kind of liking for uh, uh, pyramids. But even in these pyramids, monolithical as they are, and thus a little bit questionable, you can see uh, traces of that idealism that I mentioned. I'm not totally favoring, I'm not favoring, um, you know, monolithic structures, assertive uh, as this is, but uh, it depends, it depends. I, I don't think he, uh, he wanted to be authoritarian. Maybe he wanted to be, as I said, to, to, to provoke the students with a, with a uh, determinism of a, of a structure that, uh, in other times, for example, ancient Egypt uh, would have uh, served as a pathway towards the absolute. Do the students need uh, encouragements on towards the absolute? I, I don't know very well what to say, but I do think that education needs idealism as well. And I do believe in what Einstein said, that the student should be a you know, a burning torch of desire. And if Goldberg was right or wrong that the pyramidal form would serve such a purpose remains to be discussed. But uh, the attempt has uh, some nobility, I would say. I mean, you know, inside you can see clearly you know, sophistication and uh, even, uh, you know, some kind of, um, uh, you know, design that uh, shows uh, uh, in detail uh, a lot of care and uh, a lot of creativity as well. So it's not just a pyramid under, under which, uh, you know, it's just a lack of concern. No, within or underneath, interesting things happen that make you stop and admire perhaps or, or think about. Okay, there is maybe some of the rhetorics of, of this uh, channel of uh, walking between some buildings. Uh, there is a certain, um, you know, amplified um, uh, ethos, but <clears throat> even this has some force. It, it has some aesthetical force and, and this is important in architecture. Even here, you know, uh, uh, you know, a sofa 
for a bench, but look at what is happening above it. You know, it's provocative, it's virile, it's, it's vi vitalistic or vital. Unfortunately, it used a lot of concrete and uh, concrete pollutes, but at the time when it was built, uh, there were no concerns about the melting of the icebergs and the rising levels of the seas. <clears throat> Diagonals are stimulative. They invite to, you know, uh, taking, uh, you know, a position, taking a stand, uh, being uh, active, being uh, alive, being uh, inquisitive, being iconoclastic. Maybe not always is great in the work of Bertrand Goldberg, but we are reviewing the work of an architect and not just a builder. <clears throat> In other words, not, not the work of someone who just places a stone above another stone or places a stone above another stone and, and makes them talk. He attempted in his own way, now if he succeeded or not, we can discuss to make the stone sing, as Paul Valéry said in his little book, Eupalinos Ul Architect, Eupalinos or the Architect. Maybe Bertrand Goldberg was not always an Eupalinos, but he attempted to be one. Thank you. So let's wish him happy birthday.